I'd like to welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to our guest lecture series. This is the first one for the school year 2021-2022. Uh, and we're very fortunate to have with us uh, Dr. Clayton Thine from the University of Kentucky. He is the chair of the political science department. His uh, degree is from the University of Nebraska. He has gone on to achieve the highest degree. His PhD was earned at the University of Iowa. And he went on from teaching at uh, Cornell College in Iowa. He went on to teach at the University of Kentucky, starting out as an assistant professor. And in 2018, he was conferred professor status. And as I mentioned, he is the chair of his department. He is here today to discuss with us the topic of NATO and the Baltics. He's going to share information from his research and or his notes that he has done. And then, as I mentioned to some of the students that were here earlier, I will interview him just briefly for a few minutes. And then once that's done, we'll turn it over to you to ask questions. So I'm asking my students in particular, if you would please you know, take notes. If something is not clear to you, this isn't just talking to you. We want to explain important concepts that will help you to be more prepared for the upcoming debates. But this is also a public meeting, meaning that even if you're not intending to compete, we still want you here to educate you about the topics that we've been learning. And so at this time, without any further ado, I'd just like to welcome uh, Dr. Thine and thank you very much for being here. Thanks, Coach Bill. Uh, this is the second time I've been able to present in front of a, a group like this with the same same title of the group. I don't know if it's the same students, um, but it, I very much believe in what y'all are doing. And I, I would give my left arm to have this when I was in high school. Um, fascinating. I didn't meet my first professor until I showed up for my first class as a freshman in college. Um, so we're going to get to NATO and the Baltic states. But what I really care about is providing students with the general framework for understanding um, not just what's happened in the past, what might come in the immediate future, but, but understand what's going to be out there 40 years from now. Um, and so we're going to start with theoretical framework, and then we'll move to, to the Baltic states. And so that, that theoretical framework basically is just why do wars begin, right? Because the, the major point of NATO is that uh, we don't have wars. It wants to end wars, and it's done an exceptional job of that. But to understand why NATO has been so beneficial over time, First, we have to understand the puzzle of wars, and, and it is quite a puzzle why wars begin. Um, because if you go ask your average person on the street, hey, why do wars begin? Um, most people are going to talk about things like ethnicity or religious differences or, or maybe like crazy leaders or something like that. Well, none of those is very really satisfying theoretically to us or even empirically because uh, they just don't bear out this puzzle of warfare. Why, why does it happen? And, and the reason, again, part of the reason, well, not part of the reason, the entire reason war is so puzzling is because it's so stinking costly. I mean, it's absolutely costly to get into war. And obviously, the most obvious thing are deaths. But, um, you know, a, a tank, just a, an Abrams tank. Uh, I don't know if you guys know what kind of gas mileage a tank gets, but it's about a half mile to a gallon. And they essentially run on jet fuel. This isn't um, just going up to Conoco and filling them up. But the amount of money spent on warfare um, and the amount of people that die is, is tragic and awful. And thus, the question is always, why do these stinking things ever begin? Because we should be able to predict the likely outcome of a war. And if we can predict the outcome of a war pretty well, we should be able to work backwards and avoid the war altogether. Um, so if we take a war like Afghanistan, for instance, um, that thing didn't turn out well for anybody, right? So 20 years and a few trillion dollars we spent there, uh, uh, what, two to 3,000 troops died, and we kind of ended up a little, you know, mostly back where we started. So it's puzzling, right? If we would have known today what we knew back in, in the early 2000s, we wouldn't have got involved in it. And, and the same thing goes from the Taliban side of thing, right? Um, so the Taliban, they're back in charge. But then you spent the last 20 years uh, getting bombed and killed and worried about drone strikes. So they haven't had the happiest 20 years either. Um, so on both sides of that coin, you would think that we could go back 20 years. And, and if we knew, again, knew what would happen today, we'd go back 20 years ago and we'd figure out a way to settle it. So again, I'm going to give you the theoretical framework on how we've decided to, or how we figured out why wars begin, and then we'll bring NATO in. Um, so why do wars happen? 
Um, how I teach my students, I'll do the same with you. I, I imagine a scenario where uh, Coach Bill and I meet uh, in a, a dark alley and we don't know each other. We meet right in the middle and there's $100 bills, $100 worth of $1 bills stacked on top of each other, right? And so there's lots of things that Coach Bill and I could do. Um, one is we could just fight until one of us died or one of us was incapacitated and then we just take the hundred dollars. But as coach Bill and I both know is that um, getting punched in the nose hurts, right? So we want to avoid the cost of fighting. And so usually what would happen is both people would size each other up and we'd say, you know, coach Bill, I only, I've only seen you on zoom, but you know, 50, 50, I'm happy with, I think you're younger than me. Um, but so I, I'd maybe you could take 60 and I could take 40, um, but we would avoid the cost of fighting. Um, so how we represent that with, with our, our theoretical models is something that looks like this. We call it a unidimensional policy space. But the idea is that um, this side A, state A, or group A, or whatever, um, gets everything they want, and group B gets everything they want. Um, so we'll make bill A and, and me B, and this would be bill getting hundred all $100 bills, and then um, me getting all $100 bills. Or if you want to put in real life terms, this would be um, Iran getting nuclear weapons without any sanctions or anything. They just get them. And this would be the, the rest of the world essentially saying Iran gets absolutely nothing and they get dismantled and we instituted de democratic government, right? Um, and so, so what would happen again, this is kind of like Bill and I, or Coach Bill and I sizing each other up. We both, um, look at the other side and we develop expectations for what would happen if a war began. Um, and so this expectation is, is me thinking I'm pretty tough, I guess. Um, but this is me saying, if a war begins, um, I'm gonna get most of my preference, right? So this is beyond half. I'm gonna get roughly two thirds of the area. And then, and then Bill for some reason, or Coach Bill thinks for some reason, we're about equal, equal, 50-50. Uh, so, so Coach Bill's willing to, to take 50. So I want, you know, $70 and coach Bill wants 50. Right now we got a problem. Okay. Because we're not seeing eye to eye on who would win this fight. And a fight is likely to break out. However, wars are inefficient and fighting is inefficient. It hurts to get in a fight. It hurts to get in a war with, again, as I mentioned, with the death and the cost. So each of us is going to give up more than we would expect, right? So I think I could get $70, but I'm willing to say, you know what, I'll go $50 on it, right? Um, and, and, and Coach Bill says, you know what, I think you could get 50, but I'll go to, you know, 35. I'll be happy with 35 just because I don't want punch in the face, right? Um, so what ends up happening is the settlement zone. And this settlement zone is fantastic um, because it explains exactly why wars don't happen. We don't have to see perfectly eye to eye to avoid a war because war is costly. Um, and so, again, nothing I've talked about here would have anything to do with the average person on the street. I haven't talked about religion. I haven't talked about democracy. I haven't talked about anything. I've just talked about your ability to understand how you would do if a fight broke out. And so this very simple thing explains all the peace we have in the world. Um, and we have an enormous amount of peace in the world. And these very simple assumptions, right? Just being able to see eye to eye or, or come close and knowing that war is costly explains a lot of peace. Okay, that's peace. So why do wars happen? Um, so most things that happen in the world don't change a whole lot. So let's pretend that, um, you know, if we want to do with this Coach Bill and I reference, this would be like uh, my brother coming in behind me and backing me up or his brother or something like that. But, but you guys are smart. Let's just make it to the... Um, international relations. We don't need the, the cheap reference anymore. Um, let's just pretend that, uh, that uh, with the, the U.S., let's go to the Iranian nuclear deal. That'll be easy. Um, the United States wants um, half of this. They, they say we're not going to dismantle the Iranian government. We just don't want them to have nukes. Um, and, and Iran um, wants nukes for um, deterrent capability, but they don't want them for offensive capabilities, right? So if, if instead of the U.S. it becomes all of NATO, what that's going to do is that Iran's going to see that. They're going to say that's perfectly credible information, and the bargaining zone will shift to our side. Um, similarly, like if, if Saudi Arabia came in on Iran's side and supported them, it would shift to Iran's side. 
However, the, the, the critical point here is that if you have good information, um, a good way to update based on new things that happen, this bargaining zone did not change. Peace still exists, okay? So why peace out or why war breaks out is if somebody underestimates or overestimates how strong they are. If there's some issue that causes um, you to update differently. So it, let's bounce, bounce back to the Coach Bill and me example. Uh, we're sizing each other up, but if, I don't know if Coach Bill is a black belt in Taekwondo, right? That would be information that I wouldn't have by looking at him. So I might say I get $70 and he's saying, no, I get $95. Um, and, and, and if that happens, let's see, or, or the opposite, I, I have a gun in, behind me and he doesn't know that, right? If, if we have some informational problem, what will happen is that I will demand more than, Bill is, than Coach Bill is willing to accept and we'll have a zone of divergence. All right, so why, why does war actually happen? There's two reasons it happens. And again, I'm not gonna talk about religion or ethnicity or any of that stuff. One is informational uncertainties and two is credible commitment problems. So the first one is akin to me not knowing if Coach Bill has a black belt, right? The basic idea is that we, it's hard to tell how strong that oppo opposing side is. It's hard to know if their allies are really gonna come and support them. Um, it, it, it's hard to know if they're developing some weapons program we don't know about, we haven't seen. Um, so if you're not sure who's gonna win that fight, you're more likely to fight. Um, and then the second one is credible commitment problems. And this would be, uh, I'll just extend the analogy for fun here with, with me and Coach Bill, but the credible commitment problems would be that once we divide that money, are we gonna trust each other to turn around and walk out of that alley, right? Or is, is Bill, Coach Bill gonna start walking away and I'm gonna shoot him? I'm gonna run behind him with a brick and smash him in the head. Um, so how that, that works itself out in international relations is it, can you trust them to abide by that commitment that they just made? Um, this is part of the reason why interstate wars have largely gone away and it's moved to civil wars because in a civil war, you can devise a warning agreement, uh, but, but at the end of the day, those rebels have to lay down their guns um, because the, the government has to be the sole purveyor of violence in a country, the sole legitimate purveyor of violence in a country. Um, and if the rebels don't trust the government once they lay down those guns, they're never going to lay down the guns. Um, so those credible commitment problems, abiding by any sort of agreement and, and trusting the other side to abide by that can also lead to warfare. Um, here, we're going to focus mostly on information, but just keep those in mind. And, and hopefully you understand sort of the beauty of what I just told you. So when we think about um, like energy, your brain bounces to hopefully the equals MC squared, right? The most, the most beautiful, elegant um, uh, equation ever written. I, I've got to say like Einstein figured out energy and mass with a single equation. It's just got um, a few components in it. We're not, we're not Einstein. We're not as good as him, um, but we've come a long ways in understanding how warfare works by simply looking at these three things. We don't need proper nouns like Hitler or, or Germany or anything like that. We don't need to know your religion. We don't need to know democracy. We don't need to know any of that. We just need to know these two things and we can solve a lot of war. All right, so let's bounce to NATO and then tie it all together. So, so Coach Bill told me you, you've already learned quite a bit about NATO. And so I'm, I'm not gonna dive into any of this stuff with great detail. Um, except to say that, uh, you know, I'm going to point your attention to here, I think, um, just to make sure we understand the point of deterrence. So during the Cold War, NATO did nothing. And I put nothing in quotation marks for a reason. Um, that, that's the whole point <laughs> of an alliance like NATO is that nothing happens, right? So it's, it's one of these things our former president really bashed on NATO a lot. You know, are they relevant? Are they doing anything? Well, uh, it's kind of weird, but you know they're doing something if they're not doing anything, right? Um, that's, that's the point, is that um, by them never having to act, um, they're doing their job. Um, sort of like a bouncer at a, club, a nightclub or a bar or something like that. Like your best bouncers, you want them to be six, eight guys with biceps out to here, right? And And they're doing their job if nobody gets in a fight and nobody challenges them and nobody, no underage kids try to get into the bar. 
Um, so they're doing a good job if absolutely nothing happens. Um, same thing with NATO. Um, so yeah, our, uh, Article 5, this uh, an attack on one of us is attack on all of us. It's only been used once and it was against a non-state actor, essentially. I mean, it was, I guess, technically Afghanistan, the Taliban, but um, it was them harboring uh, Al-Qaeda. Um, so it was, it's never been used for sort of the purpose it was meant to be used for, um, which again is evidence that, that it's effective. Um, and then the, I guess the, when we're, we're, we're checking out the Baltic states, we got our Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. That's the ones we're going to focus on here. Um, the second thing to, to think about with NATO um, is that NATO is, NATO is the U.S., okay? Um, the other NATO powers should really be thought of as more as powers, okay? So, so Britain spends some money, and yes, they have some nukes, and so does France. Um, they spend some money, and they have some nukes, but really, uh, NATO is all about the United States. Um, we helped invent it. We invented it. Um, it wouldn't have existed without the United States and us basically coming out of World War II saying that uh, our isolationist principles are just dumb. They didn't work. We just had a terrible war. We need to think more broadly about us and our security. And so when you come to how the NATO spends its money and where it gets its money, um, a tiny percent of, of what NATO does, um, those are contributions you have to make. Um, but the bulk of what it does when we're talking about actually moving troops around, those are voluntary contributions. Those are just um, Canada saying we're going to send this many troops and, and we're going to send we're going to run this many uh, missions. Um, but without the United States, NATO just isn't all that strong. All right, so the Baltic states, I'm not going to say a whole lot about the Baltic states, except that these are the Baltic states, their new um, entries into NATO. Um, they're amazing countries. I mean, they really are amazing, beautiful countries, not only geographically, but um, what they've done since getting independence from the Soviet Union following the end of the Cold War is borderline incredible. Uh, being adjacent to Europe helps a little bit, but uh, we're talking about consolidated democracies. Uh, high human development index I have on here. They're part of the Eurozone. They're part of the EU. Uh, to transition to where they have in such a short amount of time is, has been just completely remarkable. Um, so they, they, they are the type of states you want to protect for sure. Um, and so, so tying this together. Um, so I want to go back to the informational uncertainties. Uh, because a few big things have happened that should make the Baltic states and all of NATO worried. Um, one is with the Ukraine, um, with uh, the Soviet or Russia um, annexing Crimea. Uh, that now Ukraine's not a part of NATO, so we didn't have to evoke NATO. We didn't have to say we have to come to their security, but that was egregious. Okay, so uh, since World War II, the idea of one state taking over another state or another part of the state's territory does not happen very often. Um, and, and the most famous time it happened is when uh, Hussein in Iraq tried to take over Kuwait and the world went crazy. Um, and, and we pushed Hussein out of Kuwait very quickly because we said, we're not gonna have another World War II. This is not gonna happen. Um, so right now, Russia doesn't know where the line is. Like it, it is uncertain about whether or not NATO or the United States actually has a red line or if we're just all cheap talk and we'll allow them to do anything they want. So there's a lot of uncertainty there and compounding that the Baltic states are very weak. Uh, they're amazing countries, but their militaries are not strong at all. Um, so today the Soviet or Russia could attack and take over uh, Latvia, Lithuania and, and Estonia um, within weeks and control those countries. And they know that um, and, and we know that, uh, but what's unknown to Russia and to me, frankly, is whether or not we would do anything about that. And so that informational uncertainty is very scary. And, and, and what happened with Ukraine uh, makes us all very scared about that. Um, the second thing is a credible commitment. Um, and, and basically, uh, yeah, can Putin trust Biden? I mean, that's what we're looking at here um, because uh, the, the credible part here is that if we shipped a bunch of troops to protect these countries, 
Um, Biden's going to have to look Putin in the eye or talk to him on the phone. This is literally going to be a high level conversation and convince him that we're not doing this because we're going to attack you. We're doing this because we want to share the security of Europe and our partners. Um, but can we credibly commit to that in a way that, that Putin believes? I don't know. Um, so I'll, I'll just get to the punch here. I, I say here, um, if President Biden called me on the phone right now, I would say, hey, I'm on a really important Zoom call, so I can't take this. Call me back later. Uh, but that, that was obviously a joke. Uh, what I what I say right now is that I think the the tripwire uh, is the way to go. Um, the idea that uh, right now we have NATO forces in the Baltic states, but we don't have U.S. forces in the Baltic states. I think if we sent enough of them, five hundred, a thousand, uh, a rand estimate said we need more like seven uh, seventy thousand. I think that's way too high. Um, that's my last point here is that if we send too many right at once. Um, and really try to tilt the balance of power, I think that's going to freak Putin out. And that could make him cause a preventative war before those troops ever got there. But you send a, a, a few amount of troops, that's going to cost next to nothing um, in terms of our, our eight to nine hundred billion uh, dollar military budget already. Um, and and we, we go with the tripwire effect. I mean, there are times where it hasn't worked, but by and large, tripwire works. Um, so if you're not familiar with that, just the basic idea is that, um, it, so, so if you send 500 to 1,000 US troops to Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, right? So what, 3,000 max, 1,500 men, um, Russia will still win that war. They will still win that conflict. Uh, but by doing so, they would kill enough of our troops that um, the United States would react and they would react would react very forcefully. And Russia knows that we would react very forcefully, thus working their way back in the tree. They never attack in the first place. Screenshot of that if you want to. That's my email, but I do text and kid, students call me all the time. Um, that's just fine. Like if you ever want to chat about this stuff, um, I'm, I'm a nice guy. I'll, I'll chat with you. So I'll turn it over to you. Okay, so just to let everybody know, so the talk is establishing some political theory, and then he applies the theory to the lessons that we're learning. So our goal now as students who have listened to the expert share would be to try to understand, okay, how would this theory help us in explaining to a debate judge why we should believe, be believed and our evidence should be believed rather than the opinions of our opponent, which also would be supported by evidence. So what we're going to transition to now is I'm going to ask some questions based on the lecture. We have not discussed these questions ahead of time. So I'm just going by what Dr. Thine has shared, and then I'm going to ask him questions that I think are related to the debate topic. And I'd appreciate it, students, if you would take notes on this, because I think that his answers here will point us in the direction of further research that we can do that's going to help us to achieve our goal, which is to understand this topic well enough that people are gonna believe us when we speak because we have just that little extra knowledge. So my first question is, is the value of the territory worth it? Are there enough resources there that Russia would be extra interested in trying to accumulate more than say 50% of the value or is the, trade is the value of diminishing you know standing up to nato is it worth it that's the question no i mean the, the only the only strategic advantage you're getting uh if you're russia is that you're distancing the nato countries further from moscow essentially um because right now i mean what we what we care mostly about is we're talking about oil pipelines but uh, or, uh europe wants those to stay intact and and uh, functioning as much as Russia, if not more. Um, so in terms of strategic advantage, no, we're not talking about major minerals. We're not talking about uh, anything. Um, we're just talking about making sure that they have, because territory still matters. I mean, with technology, it, it feels like being in the United States that we can win wars with drones. We can't, like territory still matters. Tanks still matter. Um, so that territory matters, and that's what they want, is as much distance from them um, to potential enemies as possible. But, but that's, uh, yeah, 
I mean, if you, you ask me if it, is the war going to break out in this area? No. Nope. What about the cost? Uh, this is a follow-up question still to the idea of the Baltics being worth it. What type of investment, what kind of expenditures are we thinking that Russia would have to uh, pay in terms of blood and treasure to be able to do an invasion like that? Are we talking on the ordinance of tens of millions of dollars, potentially hundreds of millions of dollars? What type of commitment would they you know, have where they would have to impose governors that would rule and troops that would have to remain there? Can you give us an idea of the scope of investment that Russia would have to put into this for territory that we both agree isn't probably worth it? Yeah, well, I mean, so so the, the hard part of that question is that it would it all depends on what what it, what we would respond with, right? So if we if we assume that NATO would just give up these three countries and and not fight back, um, then yeah, I, I, the only estimate I would have is the few trillion dollars you spent with Afghanistan. I mean, it's going to cost them some money. Um, but I, you know, it, it's tough to cut. It, it certainly wouldn't be in the millions; it would be in the billions. Um, but it's the cost of occupying new countries is, is really difficult to estimate because you got both our backlash and domestic backlash within those three countries, right? Um, right. It would it would be a lot. Um, let's just say that it would be a lot. Uh, but you also have to add the probability that NATO would do something which I think is a really high probability. And in that case, uh, part of what's gotta be in Putin's estimation is the complete dismantling of the Russian government and him being dead at the end of the day. I mean, that's right. what he's gotta have in that equation. Let me follow up with the, uh, some empirics with Ukraine then. So I heard you mention that we didn't have a commitment to Ukraine the way that we do with the Baltics as being members of NATO. Ukraine was not a member. So in terms of credible commitment, the United States, which leads NATO, has made a promise to protect Europe. And that's what the purpose of NATO is supposed to do. And yet we watch the Russian Federation march into the, the Crimea part of Ukraine with pretty much no resistance at all because there was such a weak resistance. They just didn't believe that NATO was going to do anything. They made that calculation. Do you think that their respect for NATO was high enough that they would not do the same thing? Because from the look of the research, it seems that there's an overwhelming force from the Russian Federation and that our troops in the Baltics represents a very small contingent could you please maybe address this idea of how the Baltics would be a different situation because they're members of NATO? Well, so so one big difference is if we did nothing about the Baltics, if, if Russia invaded, NATO would cease to exist. I mean, the entire world that we have created following World War II would cease to exist. Like security as we know it would end because um, nobody could ever trust um, the United States or any NATO power ever again. Um, and and so what does that mean? Well, that I mean, it well it means that we're we're scared at night again. Uh, but just in pure economic terms, um, if you can't count on security, uh, your entire globalized world collapses. I mean, this we're we're seeing a little bit of what COVID has done to our world. When you go to Kroger, the you know, there's I tried to buy steaks last night for my family. There was no steaks, right? Um, that that's that's this much of what we would see if if what we trust in security collapse. Um, we re, we depend so much on this globalized world not having to worry about the supply chains and wars intervening with those supply chains. All of our wars right now are civil wars. Like interstate wars have just gone away. Like we just don't have to worry about governments fighting each other right now, which allows you know, Ford say, if I want a windshield, where do I want that being made? Um, basically anywhere, right? They can do whatever they want. Um, so I think if you if you go down the game tree of what U.S. decision makers would be thinking, um, it, it is the collapse of everything we built since World War II. And so I, I just think the cost would be so enormously high. Um, not only hey, that that's economically, but add politics, um, Biden would, if he, there's no way he's getting reelected if he allows Russia to take over one of those countries. There's no way. 
I understand. What about the possibility of overestimation? Uh, we talked about Vladimir Putin. I want to interject something that was not mentioned in the, ledger, uh, in the lecture, which was about perhaps his ego, his desire to return to the old ways and his political narrative of what keeps him in power. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that he listens to his leaders if they tell him that, that we have some sort of stability in the region, but yet he might not listen because he has a, a higher agenda? Yeah, no, so this is part of what we set aside um, and we've learned for good reason to set it aside um, because uh, one, it's impossible to just get into another human's head and, and to think about what they're, they're thinking. But the second thing is that, um, that we don't need to. Um, Vladimir, Vladimir Putin is brilliant. He is a brilliant, smart man. He is evil, but he is brilliant and he is rational actor. Um, and he wants to stay in power as long as possible and gain as much wealth as he can. And the last thing he wants to do is be killed by a U.S. Marine. Um, and so, uh, you know what, because we don't have to go as far as Putin. I was just on the radio last week talking about Taliban and, and the Taliban are rational actors. I mean, what they have done um, over the last year has proven to me that they are evil. They are bad people, but they are smart. And they make the exact decisions I would make if I wanted to uh, gain and maintain power. Um, and I was also evil. <laughs> right. Um, and um, so, yeah, Putin's a smart guy. He's not going to mess this up. Thank you for answering that, because I know that goes beyond the scope. Let's go back into the scope of what you actually talked about. And I'd like to address the issue of credible commitment with regard to in the diplomacy that existed leading to the status quo, the way things are right now, the number of troops that are there, and our diplomatic relationship with the Russian Federation and, say, generals to generals, explaining themselves and, and what their purposes are. Do you think that a significant increase in troops and or weapons, for example, air policing, could that be perceived as a violation of the diplomacy that led to the conditions right now to the point where it could increase risk? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if, if you guys get a chance. I think it's 2017 Rand report. Really solid report. They did war game simulations on uh, what we should do about uh, uh, the Baltic states and NATO. And the, their report, they wanted, I think I read it earlier this morning, um, 77,000 troops they wanted. Um, and it, I, to me, that's just way too high, way too high, because because um, Putin is a rational actor. Uh, you know, a thousand troops, five thousand troops. He doesn't really need to explain that to his domestic population, and that's not enough to come anywhere near taking over Moscow, right? He can live with that, um, so he can fall asleep at night and just be cool with that. And he was actually, or, or Russia was actually pretty cool with the the Baltic states joining NATO. Like nobody, they didn't really put up a huge fuss over that because uh, it really didn't threaten them. Now you put you're pushing 100,000 troops um, right on their doorstep. Imagine Russia uh, putting 50,000 troops uh, on the Rio Grande, right? And saying that's just for defensive capabilities. Well, okay, you say that, but now I'm worried um, that you're not thinking defense, you're thinking offense, right? Um, so I think we push too hard and that will increase informational uncertainties um, because that's enough to do some damage. Um, so yeah, don't push too hard. Okay. Well, then let me talk to you about doing nothing. I really enjoyed your uh, twist of the phrase. By doing nothing proves that NATO works. Because <laughs> if they're not doing anything, then they're doing their job, which is they're deterring rivals, and therefore they've done their job. Nothing needs to be done further. I want to take this a step further. Do you think the Russian Federation exploits the perception that NATO does nothing so therefore, NATO doesn't have value, that it's not worth its cost and it's not worth the effort. Do you think they were able to exploit the idea that from our team, we think NATO not doing anything is good, but then we elect right. someone like the previous president who did not have much respect for what NATO does, you know, and wants the Europeans to pay for it instead of the Americans. Do you think that feeds into this, uh, to this, rhetoric that perhaps comes from Moscow that says NATO is a worthless organization. It is not credible. It's ineffectual. Costs too much. Yeah. Yeah. No, 100%. Yeah. And I, I mean, we, we know this. It's not only they, we know that they spread 
uh, false information through our social media um, and, and do this to make sure that nothing, Russia would like nothing more than to undercut NATO, right? Um, in the absence of NATO, we might be communists right now. I mean, NATO was, uh, I, I, the kids on this call don't remember the Cold War and, and Coach, Coach Bill, I don't, I, I really can't tell how old you are, um, but I'm 43 and I remember the Cold War and those, that was scary, man. Like that, those were scary days. Like the evil empire was an evil empire. Like it wasn't fun to live in the Cold War. Um, and so NATO kept us safe and to dismantle NATO would be the best uh, championship he could ever win. So anybody questioning NATO, and I got my students, they do it all the time. And, and I'm not mean to students at all, but we address that very, very quickly um, because uh, NATO is the reason why when we go to bed tonight, we're going to be worrying about finances or relationships or something else like that. But we're not, we don't have any existential threats in our, our life. Like there's nothing that you and I are worried about as an existential threat. Like we are going to exist tomorrow. And, and we are the first generation in the history of this country that can say that, right? This is the first time in the history of the country we can say that um, because NATO won. And so we don't ever want NATO going away. And Putin will do all it can to make NATO go away. And I, I do not think Trump was an agent of Russia, um, but I think that if he were, he would have behaved in the exact same way because he did everything that Putin wanted. <laughs> in reference to NATO, like everything. That makes sense. I just wanted to touch on one last thing, if we may, and then I'd like to open it up for the students, even though we were just a little bit over the projected time, but we will still end pretty close to on time, students. But this, the last question has to do with your reference to the tripwire. You explained the tripwire. Does the metaphor itself help the students to understand what a tripwire is, perhaps in a military terms of, of how, if we were protecting ourselves, we would set up a tripwire that might give us a warning of some kind, or do we just want the tripwire in a different type of metaphor that says that if they were to do this, it sets up a tripwire, tripwire which could easily lead to a nuclear exchange. Would you just clarify a little bit more what you mean when you were teaching us about tripwire? And just one last time, how does 500 to 1,000 US troops make such, make such a significant difference when there's gonna be 100,000 Russian Federation troops on the other side of the border, and yet 1,000 is enough to stop them? Would, do you mind clarifying that as the last point I'll ask about? Sure. So when we think about tripwire with deterrence, um, the idea is that, uh, so so if you had infinite money, um, what you would do is, is send many battalions to any potential enemy, um, but uh, you don't have infinite money. So what you can do with the tripwire is send enough troops that it matters to you. And so the, the those troops, uh, what Schelling said, but Basically, what those troops are there to do, those 500 to 1,000 troops, their job is, this is bluntly, but their job is to die. Um, so if Russia invaded, their job would be to die. And, and what would happen if 500 to 1,000 troops died is that Biden would have absolutely no choice but to go full force against Russia to, to fight back, because we're not going to allow 500 to 1,000 troops to die um, without a, a massive response. Um, so they die, we go full force to Russia, this becomes an absolutely huge war, perhaps a nuclear holocaust, right? And so what Russia is doing is they're thinking the same thing. They're like, yeah, we, don't, we kill 500 troops. Um, what happens next, right? What happens next is that Biden um, goes nuts um, and they go full force. So that tripwire is, 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 yeah, just the idea. Now, is it a good analogy? Yeah, probably not, because um, tripwire is more well, like- It is a preferred military term. So we are yeah. speaking properly. It is a preferred military term for us terminology to use. So it is at least in the literature for the students to understand. So but just make sure you understand it, because to me, it's not not as obvious what it, that it's a tripwire. Tripwire is like early warning, like when mm -hmm. I think of tripwire. Um, this is uh, early warning with massive costs that force you to react. Right. It's not, sure. you can't flee. Like, but what if you had the tripwire exposed? So they would see the tripwire, but not in a way to circumvent it. But they're like, oh, it's a tripwire. If I cross this border, I'm going to set off an explosion. 
you know, and that's going to really damage it. You know what I'm saying? So that's that perhaps could be explaining for the students to understand this metaphor. Yeah, sure. Maybe booby trap. Maybe or booby trap might be good. something, right? Yeah, you, you trip over the wire and you die, right? So thank you, Dr. Than, for answering my questions. And I did listen carefully to the lesson and I wanted to apply as best I can. But the real proof is from the students. If, at this time, if I have a student that's brave enough and willing to turn their camera on, turning your camera on signifies you have a question. And I don't mind how many cameras come on, but it'd be nice if you would, uh, if you have a question, you know, cue it up and we will answer the questions at this time. My name is Aaron George. I go to the School for the Creative and Performing Arts. I'm a literary arts major and I'm in the fifth grade. So my first question is, what does NATO stand for? So think of the Atlantic Ocean, right? So the north part of the Atlantic Ocean, uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So it's mostly started with Western Europe and the United States and Canada. And it's mostly Europe and the United States and Canada. Okay, and my next question is, who founded NATO? Okay, uh, the original people, uh, yeah. So in 1949, but I, I think the easiest way to think of it is the the major powers who won World War II. Um, so the the big actors you're thinking about like France and um, United Kingdom and the United States. Uh, go ahead, Ikantika. You have a question. I'm Ikantika. I go to Mizik Middle School, and I'm in seventh grade. And um, so the questions I had was that while I was researching on NATO, I came across like two things I didn't quite understand. So the first one was, like, what is a, a, Rush, a NATO Russia Council? Like, I didn't quite understand that. Um, then how NATO was involved with it. And then how um, Russia kind of like cooperated more with NATO. In the 90s, uh, something that unique happened, we had a shift away from this Cold War mentality where Russia is just absolutely the enemy. And in matters of uh, terrorism, uh, under President Clinton, we had some terrorist acts and his attitude toward Russia showed a shift in U.S. policy and we had more cooperation. And then this continued under President Bush as well, where he found ways to cooperate with the Russian Federation. You're talking about a time period where there was a major shift where the United States and NATO had kind of won the Cold War and that Russia kind of wanted to join NATO at that point, ironically. Mm -hmm. Now, does that help you to have the context to understand why this council was created and why Russia would appeal to such a council for membership and or looking for ways to cooperate? Yeah. Okay, and you wanted to follow up, you have a follow-up question? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if this was technically correct, but other than the other countries that are like part of NATO already, was like Morocco um, kind of part of it or was it like completely different from it? Um, Coach Bill, you might be able to help me out here, but as, as I understand it, this is part of the, uh, like the broader effort to not necessarily expand NATO, but to increase security and it's a uh, Mediterranean something. Um, mm -hmm. cooperative if I remember right. That's right and uh, I just want to comment that the NATO has an expanded mission that goes beyond its members so article 5 says you attack one of us you attack all of us that's a military alliance and it's a pretty well articulated defense cooperation policy and so they also have expanded policies and that's where Ukraine was protected under the treaty called the NPT the non-proliferation treaty because they gave up nuclear weapons that they were using to stop Russia from invading them and we basically promised them that if they gave up their nuclear weapons that Europe would be protected by NATO and that you know we would pretty much guarantee their territorial integrity now it turns out that we didn't that when the Russian Federation invaded and took the Crimea region which is exactly what the Ukraine government feared at the time that we asked them to give up their nuclear weapons, it might have triggered a war. But President Obama, you know, having a, a strategic mind, used the language of the treaty to demonstrate that this did not automatically trigger a war. And he was able to use diplomacy to try to defuse the situation. But I, as far as Morocco, I know we're not answering Morocco. It goes beyond our ability to answer without more context to Contica. If you can come back to us with that, either one of us will answer the emails about that for certain. Okay, thank you. Hi, Emma, please introduce yourself and ask your question. 
Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, I'm Emma Cleaver, and I go to Discovery School, and that's located at Hebron Middle School, and I'm in the sixth grade. Mm -hmm. And my question is that multiple sources have stated that Russia is going to target the Baltics next, even though the Baltics aren't as valuable as some may think. So do you think the Baltics are the next target, and would this impact the decision of increasing the Baltics' defenses? The answer is no. Um, I believe in NATO. I believe in the deterrent power of NATO. If there were a next target, it would absolutely be the Baltic states, okay? Um, but I don't think there's much of a chance of Russia actually doing that. I think that we would follow NATO. Um, now, had Trump been reelected, my answer might be a little bit different, to be honest. Um, but I don't think there's any chance of, of of Biden not following through with uh, Article 5 of the NATO Charter. They think ahead on, on what happens next. Uh, and I, I don't think it's gonna happen next. Emma, do you have a follow-up question to us? Nope, but thank you so much. Thank you, Emma. Is there another student who would like to uh, take, the can take a moment, just turn your camera on? Hey, Mumika, welcome. Are you going to ask a question? Please introduce yourself and, and thanks for asking a question. We really want this to be about you. Okay. Um, my name's <clears throat> Umi Karana. Um, I go to East Town Middle School and I'm in seventh grade. Um, my question is, do you think Russia may attack another member of the NATOs and not NATO and not the Baltics, maybe? Um, hmm. So Mika, first I gotta say that. I've, I've got a daughter in seventh grade at least Town Middle School. So if you see Sydney, tell her hi. <laughs> um, but, but second, um, no, the, the, the next one, fourth on the list would be Poland, okay? Um, but we, we have US troops in Poland. We have a few thousand troops in Poland. And going back to that tripwire idea, um, if, if Russia hurt those US troops, you and I would be pretty angry, right? <laughs> um, and I, they know that. And so they're not gonna do it. Um, so I, I don't think there's much of any chance uh, of Russia attacking. I, I, I really think Russia is, is done <laughs> uh, with attacking other countries. If you listen to Vladimir Putin, now he gave a good 60 minutes, maybe a few years ago. Um, he's evil, he's bad, but he's brilliant. And he puts together a very convincing argument for why it was okay for them to take Crimea. There is a legal argument to be made and I don't like it and I don't buy it, but there is an argument, a reasonable argument that can be made for that. Now, the rest of it, there is no argument that can be made. That's just raw aggression. Um, and I don't think he'll cross that line. Okay. Okay, and then uh, Ikantika, welcome back. So my question was, is there like, um, even though NATO's like uh, countries and like the Baltic states and uh, countries put together, is it, um, is there like a certain leader of NATO or do they all just decide together on decisions? Um, kind of a mix. Uh, so when it comes to say NATO decides that um, we need to do something about Syria, okay? That's gonna be up to each individual country if they actually want to do something, right? So it, uh, countries have to send airplanes and pilots or tanks and and troops, okay? So, so each individual country has a lot of discretion about what they wanna do. Now, in terms of the main commander, um, the, the main uh, military person who runs NATO, um, that is and will always be and always has been uh, a US uh, person. So that was Eisenhower's first job, right? Um, and so uh, that's one thing that the US kind of demands um, is that, whoever's in charge of NATO for the, the military operations, um, our soldiers will never serve under a different flag. Um, if they're on a NATO force, they will serve under a, a US general that's working for NATO, but they're not gonna serve under a French general. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. US dominance and NATO should not be dismissed. US leaves and this thing's done. And we foot the bill. Yes, we do. We foot the bill. It, would you say it's a form of investment? We invest in NATO so that we don't actually have to fight a more expensive war 
and a more costly war in terms of blood and treasure later? Without a doubt. I mean, not only NATO, but we're talking about the United Nations, like the World Bank, IMF, uh, the people that invented the world we live in following World War II were some of the smartest humans on earth. Um, they gave us 70 years of peace and prosperity that we take for granted. And so many leaders like to tear down those institutions. And I'm just like, this world has been bloodshed. The entire world that we know about until these people invented these institutions so that I could grow up in a world where I have never been worried about dying. Professor Thine, thank you so much for coming in and doing this for us. Uh, we are mostly middle schoolers who don't know a lot about NATO, but I think we're a lot more educated because of you. So we just want to say thank you to you. And so can we everyone just kind of like, just kind of show appreciation, just wave your hands like this in the air. It's like showing applause for someone and showing thank respect. Okay. And then now we're going to wave goodbye to everyone. So uh, thank you all very much. Thanks, students. Thank you. Have great Bye. semesters. Bye-bye, y'all. Thank you. Very appreciative.